Hey, good morning, church. I'm so glad that you are joining us today as we carry on with our series through Ezra. And as you heard in the announcements, and next week we're going to take a bit of a break from uh, our Ezra series. So after today, we're going to be halfway through the book of Ezra. So it's kind of like a, a half time. And I'm so excited to have Professor Daryl Bach with us. So I've listened to him. I think most of the times that he's come to this country, he's a phenomenal Bible scholar and just such a great preacher and a great guy. And I'm just uh, so excited to have him with us next week. And then after that, uh, we'll carry on with the second half of Ezra. So for today, we're in Ezra chapter 5. So if you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to Ezra chapter 5, uh, we'll be going through chapter 5 and probably about the first 12 verses of chapter 6 as well. And so while you're turning there, let me just remind you of where we are in this book. So God's people have been in exile in Babylon for about 70 years, and God makes a way for them to go back home to Jerusalem and begin rebuilding their lives. And so about 50,000 of them go back to Jerusalem and they start by rebuilding the altar and the foundations of the temple. And you might remember at that point, that's Ezra chapter 3, it's just a really incredible occasion. They celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. There's just such a lot of joy. It's like almost like revival and there's just such great optimism in the air. And then opposition comes. That's what we looked at last week in Ezra chapter 4. Uh, the southern kingdom, uh, their old enemies, right, the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, now kind of mixed with Assyrian descent, come to oppose their work on the temple. And they bring this kind of opposition in the form of, of kind of a force and by manipulation and politics, it's kind of wave of opposition upon them. And it works. Work on the temple stops. So we ended off last week. It stops for 15 years. Nothing happened. And just think about, think about 15 years. Like a lot can happen in 15 years. I mean, your baby can grow up and become a teenager in 15 years. A lot can happen in the world in 15 years. So 15 years ago, 2005, uh, our country was a pretty different place. Thabo and Becky was still president. Uh, Tswane was still called Pretoria. I mean, it's kind of like it's just like a whole new, a whole different time. So nothing happens, nothing for 15 years. And you can almost imagine that original building that they had started working on is, is now just a pile of rubble and maybe there's like just rocks and stones lying around there's weeds coming up maybe as you know from abandoned building sites maybe it had become a bit of a dumping ground or maybe like kids just use it as a place to go and and play but nothing had happened for 15 years and you just got remember god had particularly stirred up the hearts of these people for this job, to go back and to rebuild the temple. And sure, opposition comes and there's discouragement and disillusionment as we, look at, as we looked at last week. But 15 years? We've got to ask ourselves this morning, like what, what happened? What really happened? That for 15 years, nothing took place. Well, we're about to find out this morning what really happened. And so let's start by reading Ezra 5. I'm going to read just the first two verses. Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then... Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Now, the million-dollar question today is, 
what on earth did Haggai and Zechariah say that after 15 years of inactivity, all of a sudden the people woke up and began rebuilding the temple? and began rebuilding it pretty courageously, I might add. If you go read the next few verses, like as they start rebuilding, immediately the governor of the area, a guy named Tatanai, comes and says, whoa, hang on, what's going on here? Who gave you permission to build here? What are all your names? It's kind of like they must have been thinking, oh my gosh, here we go again, like opposition has arrived again. And they just respond to him and they carry on working. It's almost like there's this renewed vision and a renewed courage and renewed energy for this building project which makes me wonder again what on earth did Haggai and Zechariah say to inspire this well we know exactly what they said because we have two books in the bible called Haggai and Zechariah that tell us exactly what they said. And so we're going to have a look this morning, just turn to Haggai. And I know that last year, Justin did a sermon on Haggai, just a great overview of the whole book. But I'd love to just go back there again and find out what he said that renewed the vision and energy of this group of exiles who were facing opposition in the building project. So turn to Haggai chapter one, uh, which is like really near the very end of your Bible, and, and, and while you're turning them, let me just say, I would love to get into what Zechariah said, but I'm not going to do that this morning, partly because it's a lot. So Zechariah is 14 chapters, Haggai is just two, and also Zechariah is just so wonderfully rich and complex. Uh, so maybe one day when I'm big, we'll do a series through Zechariah, but Haggai is not complicated at all. It's very hard to hear but not hard to understand what Haggai said. So if you're there, Haggai chapter one, let's just take a slow walk through the beginning of chapter one. So verse one, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. At this point, you're going, oh, hey, I know these guys. I know Zerubbabel. And the word came to Haggai in the second year of Darius. That's exactly where we left off last week. Verse 24 of Ezra chapter 4 is the work stopped until the second year of Darius. So we're exactly at the right place in the story. And then verse 2, this is what the Lord said, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not yet come to build the house of the Lord. Let's just pause there for a second. These people, meaning the exiles now in Jerusalem who haven't been building for 15 years, God says, these people are telling me the time's just not right to rebuild the house of the Lord. Which can sound quite spiritual, doesn't it? It's kind of the sense of, you know, I just really don't sense that it's the right time to be building the house of the Lord again. Sounds spiritual, but like 15 years, like immediately something seems just a little bit off here. So then verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Notice that. So it's a time for you to build your house while my house lies in ruins. I just love how kind of dry that is. You kind of put off the time hasn't been right to work on this because you've been so busy working on your own houses. And notice he even describes there while you yourselves are living in your paneled houses. And the idea there is kind of these houses with like rich 
wooden paneling, which would have been really strange for a house in Jerusalem. If you've ever been there, it's kind of there's no forest, there's no forestry industry. Like God specifically mentions these paneled houses, which are quite elaborate and expensive. I mean, for them to have gotten the wood to panel their houses with, they would have, have to have traveled up to Lebanon and kind of got the wood there and carried it back, which would have been like a really you know, costly exercise. And we know that they didn't have a lot of money, these exiles. Or, I mean, there would have been this wood available for the building of the temple. So maybe they took some of that wood and used it in their own homes. So I'm just going to leave that there. The point is this. They were paying a lot of attention to their own homes while the temple stood in ruin. God carries on in verse 5. He says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And that's like God saying, hey, let's take a time out here. You've been so busy working. Let's just let's come on over. Let's just have a chat for a second. Consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvested little. You eat but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. In other words, God's saying, okay, let's, let's chat about this for a second. You've taken 15 years off to work on your own life, to kind of rebuild your lives and to make a living for yourselves. And let's just, let's not be too hard on the exiles in Jerusalem at this point, because I'm sure we can identify with that, right? When times are really tough, so there's discouragement and opposition comes and they kind of retreat a little bit and, I'm sure you can identify there's those moments when it's just like things are so hard, so tough, and kind of just feel like you want to take a break from the intensity of the Christian life and just kind of pull back a little bit. Maybe even like right now, like this kind of lockdown difficult period. And so God, he says, I I see you've taken 15 years off to really work on your own lives and establish yourselves. And then it says this to them. And how's that working out for you? Right, you're working really hard to plant vineyards again, but you're not harvesting very much. And sure, you've, you've given yourselves food to eat, but although you have enough food to eat, you're still hungry, and you're still thirsty, and you have clothes, but you're still warm, and you're earning a wage, but it's almost like you're putting it into a money bag that has holes. Anyone identify with that feeling? In other words, God's saying, how's this working out for you? This little break that you've taken? It's not satisfying, is it? See, this idea of kind of pulling back and taking a break from relationship with God or from a fervent commitment and from serving Him, which is what they were doing, in order to focus on your own life, establish yourself, it ultimately doesn't work. No matter how hard you try and how much you have, if you're not in a right relationship with God, and by that I mean where the priorities are not right in your life, you will never be satisfied. It's exactly what God is pointing out to them. Which is a lesson we all really need to learn and learn it fast. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. 
see, we know this, this idea of right priorities, but we don't often live like it, especially when things get difficult, which is why we need these reminders, and these reminders don't come more bluntly than Haggai to the exiles living in Jerusalem at this time. Let's carry on, just verse verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways again. Now go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, my house, not your house, build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, on the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. There's a a word play. And I'm sure by now you pick up on the sentiment. You've busied yourself with your houses and neglected mine. We get that. But there's, if you want a great summary of this idea, there's a really interesting word play here. So in the original, in the original language of Hebrew, you know, and, and I mentioned this, I mean, I love the, the languages, and it's not just for interest's sake, but when there is a word play, which you, you're not going to get in English, when there is a word play like this, there's a reason for it. So when right at the end God says, I will bring a drought, but that word drought is the word horev. The same word for like desert. When I bring a drought, horev. And earlier when he mentioned ruins, so my house lies in ruins, the word for ruins is the word harev. What's a harev and horev? It's a, it's a, it's a deliberate word play. It's meant to say something, and I think it's just such a great summary, because what it's saying is, when your temple is in ruins, you can expect a drought in your life. And so the message of Haggai, it's not a complicated message. It's a message about priorities, and in particular, a warning of the danger of spiritual mediocrity. The danger of spiritual mediocrity. What I mean by that is we almost always start the Christian life with this courage and boldness and energy and enthusiasm, like they did. But then when opposition comes, disillusionment, discouragement happens, and wave after wave, then slowly we withdraw and settle back into our old lives with maybe just a few of the elements of spirituality brought back in again. That's what I mean by spiritual mediocrity. That's where these guys were living for 15 years. Hadn't abandoned God. They just abandoned their exclusive commitment to them. And the message of Haggai is this. There's nothing more unsatisfying than living in spiritual mediocrity. That's his message. That's what Haggai said. The good news is the people hear it. They listen and they respond like this, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtul, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with, with all the remnant of the people, all the exiles, 
obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as their Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. And then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Which takes us right back exactly to where we are in Ezra chapter 5. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied. And then Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the people began to rebuild the house of God. And the prophets were with them, supporting them. And listen to this, verse 5. Because as Tatanai, the governor, comes and starts asking questions, poking around. But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews. And they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. The eye of God was was on them. So Haggai and Zechariah preach. The people respond and there's this renewed sense of reverence and awe and fear of God and there's this energy and commitment and they start rebuilding and it says that the eye of God was on them which is a reference to Psalm 33. I mean, just quickly, beginning of Psalm 33, uh, sorry, verse 18 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Which is what we said, that's what we heard in Haggai. Right, verse, verse 12, the people feared the Lord. So you get a sense of what's happening in the hearts of the, of the remnant of the exiles at this time. There's this renewed sense of reverence and awe and respect for God. And they begin courageously working on what he had called them to do. And things turned around. I mean, remember Haggai, it's like, you try so hard, but you're not getting anywhere. Well, all of a sudden now, things just change. So just jump to chapter 6 for a little bit. While we had to include the beginning of chapter 6, I want to show you just how well (laughs) things went because it's just magnificent. To, and, and to cut through kind of the rest of that, so Tat and I asked them, who, let, who said that you could carry on building? And they go, hey, Cyrus, back in the day, Cyrus gave us permission, so why don't you go back to Babylon and you just find that we're going to carry on working while you go and dig up those records. And so Tat and I goes back to Darius and says, these guys are working on the temple. They say, Cyrus, let them do this. And Darius says, well, let's go find out. Let's go find the record of what Cyrus said. And so he sends the guys and they go and dig. And lo and behold, they come up with a scroll from the time where Cyrus, back in Ezra chapter 1, gave them permission to go back and rebuild the temple. And by the way, this is so fascinating. You can see that scroll of Cyrus, that exact scroll. It's actually, it's a, it's a cylinder. You know, I've written in Babylonian script. It's in the British Museum. You can go Google that. You can go see this. This is a real period of history. And they're going to find that and they bring it back to Darius and go, oh, it turns out Cyrus said this. Now, have you heard the phrase, the law of the Medes and Persians? Have you heard that? Uh, like it describes, hey, if it, once it's been said, like you better not alter it like at all. <laughs> and so they find this thing and Darius is like, well, I'm, I'm a meter and we're a Persian, so we better stick with what Cyrus said. But he adds to what Cyrus said. And this is just so amazing to me. I, just, I want you to get this picture of this renewal, this renewal of commitment. They've stepped out of spiritual mediocrity. There's courage. And, and look at how God, the eye, of, the eye of the Lord was on them. Just look at the results of this. So in Ezra 6, so, so firstly, uh, verse 7, Darius says, so uh, 
those the governors who are there, verse 6, like keep away from the work. Don't meddle with them. Verse 7, let the work on this house of God alone. That's Darius. Don't you, don't you stop them anymore. Let this work of God alone. And in verse, I just want to jump to verse 11. We're jumping all around this morning. Right? But in verse 11, uh, it, he takes it a step further. Darius adds this. Uh, do you want, to, you want to get a sense of the law of Medes and Persians? Like don't mess with the law that they've made, right? Verse 11, Darius says, also, I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, if anyone tries to change what I'm saying to leave them alone, a beam shall be pulled out of his house and he shall be impaled upon it and his house shall become a dunghill. Now that's the law of the Medes and Persians. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who shall put out a hand to alter this or anyone who will try to destroy this house of God that is in Jerusalem. Ah, Darius, make a decree. Let it be done with all diligence. I mean, how's that? They've been so harassed. In this building project, now they have this word from Darius. I mean, that, that's got to give you some sense of confidence. And Cyrus had said that this building project would be funded from the royal treasury. And so Darius finds this. And again, he adds to it. So verse 8 to 10. Moreover, Darius says, I'll make a decree regarding what you shall do for these leaders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the province from beyond the river. And whatever is needed, bulls, rams, or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests at Jerusalem require, whatever those guys want, let that be given to them day by day without fail. And I'm just trying to show you here that this period of renewal, of coming out of spiritual mediocrity, this renewed sense of awe and reverence for God, and a recommitment to making Him priority leads to nothing short of an astounding victory. And so this is what happens when stuck in spiritual mediocrity, as we so often, we so often get into that space. I've been in that space. You've been in that space. When stuck in spiritual mediocrity, when sometimes because of some rather blunt words from God, we repent and renew our commitment to Him, restore Him as priority in our lives because that's what happened there was a moment of repentance here you've got to see this it didn't just happen the people collectively acknowledged oh man this is our fault i'm not gonna i'm not gonna read it but it's in verse 11 to 17 of chapter 5 it's what they told tatanai and it's what he told darius but basically they say, we are servants of the Lord. I think it's verse 11. We're servants of the Lord. And you think, hang on. <laughs> well, 15 years you've been serving yourself. But see, now there's this renewed sin. No, we are now, we recognize once again, we're servants of the Lord. And they even tell the story. They say, yeah, the, our forefather, the kings, built this amazing temple. But because of our failure, because of our sinfulness, I mean, these are the Jewish people telling Darius, it's because of our brokenness that God sent Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the temple. That was us. But that takes quite something to put in writing an acknowledgement of your failure. I mean, what they're doing is they're acknowledging in that letter that a hundred years of struggle, that was us. It was nobody else's fault, but our own fault. See, that's repentance. There's this collective moment of repenting and of renewing their commitment to the kingdom of God again. And that's what 
turns it all around after 15 years. So I want to bring this to a close. And as I do, I just want to make sure we're really clear on what this means to us now. Because it's sometimes just really hard. We're reading these stories in the Old Testament, a very different time, a very, very different place, and wondering how that translates to us here in Joburg in 2020. And also, how does that translate this side of the cross of Jesus Christ? Because that does change things. So let me just quickly talk you through three principles, just how this does translate, so that we're sure this morning. Firstly, it is true that today there is no longer this heavy emphasis on the physical building of the temple. Right? We have to acknowledge that. As much as I love the building of Rosebank, and just by the way, I mean, before I came here, I didn't know too much about Rosebank, got to confess, except I had visited here. And honestly, I always told people, it's the most beautiful church. Like it's that right balance of it's modern, but at the same time, you know you're in a church. I mean, it's phenomenal building, but it would be wrong to step out of this, Ezra chapter five, with the sense of the focus is on the building. And this could very quickly turn into a sermon of, hey, better make sure that you're contributing to the building of this temple. And to be fair, that would not be completely far off because the principle here is people who had a concern for their own wealth and comfort that distracted them from their commitment to God's kingdom. That principle is true. And there may be some of you who are overly concerned about your personal wealth and comfort to the point where it has distracted you from your commitment to God and his kingdom. But here's how this principle translates today. And it's quite simple, really, when we recognize that even then, was actually not so much about the building of the temple either. The reason the temple was so important back then was because it was the place where God manifested his presence and the place where sacrifices happened that atoned for the forgiveness of people's sins. It's the only place that happened. That's where you experience the presence of God. That's how sins were atoned for, which is why when that temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, it was a catastrophe. Because there was no other way to be relieved of your guilt and to experience the presence of God. Now, for us today, thankfully, that has changed because of Jesus. The whole book of Hebrews is about this, that he made a sacrifice once and for all. There's no need for these sacrifices anymore in a particular place. And we now have access to the Holy of Holies and the Holy Spirit is the presence of God with us. And aren't you so glad about that? Imagine lockdown where like God only dwelt in the temple, like this room that we're in that I actually joke and call the Holy of of Holies. Imagine, the only way you could experience God was in a place that you cannot go to. That's what they were experiencing. That's not what we have today. So that changes. But don't let that privilege, don't take that for granted. Where you are lulled into a sense of spiritual mediocrity once again. So that principle translates. Secondly, when this happens, when we find ourselves in spiritual mediocrity, do you think that today God would do what he did then in a way and he would correct us in ways that are difficult by using difficult circumstances to wake us up out of spiritual mediocrity? Would God still do that today? And sometimes people have a problem with this. They see God in the Old Testament was quite angry and would discipline them. But in the New Testament, no, he's just, he just loves us. So let me just ask you this question. Simple question, but quite a deep one. Does God get angry at Christians? The answer is, well, yes, he does. He doesn't. It's not a wrath. This fury that leads to eternal condemnation because of Jesus, to be sure, that's gone. 
but he still gets displeased at us. It's kind of like just this week, a couple days ago, actually, Kristen and I were having a bit of a, of an argument and, um, you know, she, she had thought that I was angry with her about something. And I was trying to say, no, I wasn't angry with you. And eventually she said, she said, no, no, no I didn't say you were angry. I said you were mad. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is the, what is the difference? And she's like, no, angry is like, I wasn't saying that you were like the furious and like going off, but just that you were displeased. I don't know, maybe there's, there's that sense, you know, as a Christian, you will not suffer the eternal wrath of God thanks to Jesus who took that upon you. But to be sure, God will discipline us because he loves us. That's Hebrews 12. And I wonder... If God is using this time of drought, of hiref, as a means of waking us up out of our spiritual mediocrity, that we would renew our commitment to Him once again. And lastly, I'll just say this one really quickly. God does not Free us, liberate us. Like he liberated these exiles and let them go home. God does not free us and liberate us just so we can go back to focusing on ourselves. Right? I mean, this was these guys that might as well have stayed in Babylon because when they went back to Jerusalem and opposition came, they just started living like they were in Babylon again, focusing on themselves and their houses. You could have done that in Babylon. God does not liberate us just so we can go back to living like we were in Babylon once again. So I want to close us there. And we're going to have a wonderful opportunity this morning to have this moment of repentance in communion. So I'm going to pray and Pastor Darba is going to come up. Oh, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing a song to prepare ourselves for communion. Maybe get your elements ready if you haven't done that. And then Parson Dab is going to lead us in a moment of renewal. God, we come before you and confess that so often we are lulled into spiritual mediocrity. And God, I pray you would show each one of us just gathered in hundreds of homes around Joburg, watching this at different times. This is so personal to all of us. It happens in such different ways. Show us where we've been living as though we were back in Babylon. Wake us up. And press upon us this need to renew a right sense of awe and reverence for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.